May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Welcome to another Guke Audio Podcast. I'm D.C. Puba of Guke Audio and Guke Archives, preserving the legacy of Junior Suzuki and those whose paths crossed his and anything else that comes to mind. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable and free from economic hardship and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the confines of the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. Uh, today we have the third piece from Tassahara Stories, the third draft piece, named Confined. Now, this is something I wrote, I don't know, a few years ago. And um, some of them I wrote more recently. But um, I, I haven't looked at it. I'm just going to read it. And um, we'll see. Uh, this one uh, takes place in the city, you know, uh, having to do with the preparations for Tassahara and what led up to Tassahara. And, um, you know, I, one thing I'm thinking about with the book is, uh, yeah, you know, I have doubts about, I have a number of pieces about my own experiences. And I have two thoughts about it. One is a, a shorter book with just Tatsahara stories. That, well, that would probably be easier to sell, you know, like short little vignettes and stuff. <laughs> but I don't care. <laughs> I mean, I do care, but the other is like to bring in my story. And that can also make it more interesting. You know, there's two points of view. And then I think, well, just, I have so much in my own story, why not just put all of it together? So, uh, anyway, so this is one of the things that I'm thinking, the sort of thing I'm thinking of cutting. But to me, it's interesting. And, um, uh, I don't know. We'll see what happens. It doesn't matter. <laughs> anyway, uh, so after pause to meditate, we'll go in right into reading part three. Or it's not really part three. It's the third piece. Because who knows what order these things should be in. That This is the order I have them in. And I did think about order some. But... It it works for a while. I mean, I have many, many, many pieces, and then uh, it 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 doesn't really have good form, or you know, it sort of trails off toward the end. Uh, so, um, you know, that's part of making a book. If it is a book, would be to have it coalesce into some form. And I think I mentioned before that I had the same. Uh, process with thank you and okay. I had no idea where it was going, what would happen with it. Uh, but I was just concentrating on it. And now I've got many things I'm doing. So we'll see what happens. So when you hear the bell, hit pause. And uh, we'll uh, 
all meditate together or not. And then when each of us is ready to come back, we will hit unpause. And miraculously, we will arrive at the same time to hear the bell. And then I will go into reading. Confined. That's what it's called. Confined. Dots are stories. Confined. Confined. We were all giving everything we had. Cars, stocks, shoes, hats. We were all living out of backpacks. Tim Buckley. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, he told me that. Oh, I don't know. 20 years ago. <laughs> Before the drive to get the horse pasture and then keep up with the payments for Tassahara, Zen Center didn't do any fundraising to speak of. Dues were minimal. The monthly budget was about $700. There'd be a notice that money was needed for more Zafus or a cabinet. One could live cheaply in San Francisco. People didn't worry about money like nowadays. I worked at the Rincon Annex to the post office for a few hours every few days. <laughs> would check out early. Sick. As long as it wasn't three days out, I didn't need a doctor's note. That was enough to cover rent, Food, most of what I needed. Now we were squeezing every cent we had out of every talent and contact we had. Artist Jackson wrote, Trudy Dixon and I made many, many handwritten notes to Dick Baker's contacts on the East Coast requesting financial donations. They were very productive. It wasn't just Baker's contacts, though. His were impressive. It was those that came from anyone who any of us knew who might help. But Baker's list was paramount and multiplying with help from Alan Watts, Nancy Wilson Ross, Elsie Mitchell of the Cambridge Buddhist Society, David Padua with his connection to Chester Carlson of Xerox, and on and on. Support came from unexpected quarters. Kazuaki Tanahashi, a Buddhist artist and scholar, was doing fundraising for us from Hawaii. Nobody but Suzuki even knew who Tanahashi was till he showed up years later. There were art shows, benefit concerts, workshops. Alan Ginsberg said Bob Dylan had offered to pay the whole price if he could build a home there. I had a little trust fund controlled by my mother. Not much, not enough to live on. Uh, she agreed to a donation. I enjoyed the surprised look on Richard Baker's face when Scruffy Me walked in and handed him a check for $500. That's when... We'd made an initial down payment of $2,500 and were just going for the 25000 more. 
The following spring, when I was living at Tassajara and we were getting the plates together, I left a gas... Boy, I got a lot of mistakes in here. Credit card with the Carmel Valley Texaco Station. I didn't give any thought to how many cars were going back and forth on official business. <laughs> how many cars? How many cars and trucks? Got a letter from my mother which started off, I don't know how much money you think you've got, but you don't have this much. <laughs> that went on for a couple of months, and I remember one month was $900 of 1967 money. Gil and Karen Pomeroy and I left the Zen Center office with a bunch of flyers and posters for a benefit concert featuring Big Brother, The Grateful Dead, and Quicksilver Messenger Service. The information was printed over a bluish photo of the mountains around Tassajara. We headed to the Haight-Ashbury to place and hand them out wherever we could. First stop, the Littleman Supermarket at Hayton Stanion at the edge of Golden Gate Park. It was chilly and windy and I had a trench coat on. We needed tacks and tape. Hands full in an aisle, I stuck the tacks in a pocket to walk to the cashier. I'd like to say that I forgot the thumbtacks were in my pocket, but I remembered them while standing in line and had the devilish thought that, okay, I'll steal this one thing in my life. Really, I'd never stolen anything that I can remember. Just 10 cents worth of thumbtacks. As soon as I'd stepped outside the door, two men got hold of me and whisked me into an office where they had me sit next to several other longer hairs. They just apprehended the hate ashbury back then was mobbed with young people who spent whatever money they could get hold of on pot. Walking down the sidewalk, approaching youth would inquire spare change with such regularity that I'd say it to them first to keep them quiet. That ragged crowd kept security at Littleman's busy and the holding cells at the nearby park police station populated. I sat cross-legged on a bench in a cell at that very police station, practicing Zazim with eyes half open and unconcerned about my fate. A portly policeman walked by and then stepped back and looked at me. In a friendly good old boy manner, hands on hips, he asked, Are you a Hindu or a Buddhist? I'm a human being, I replied loftily. <laughs> no, I'm serious, he said. There's someone comes here, Hindus and some Buddhists. I just wanted to know which you were. I'm a Buddhist. Any particular type? Zen Buddhism. Soto Zen. Thank you. I hope everything works out for you. And he walked on. I got to ride in a paddy wagon to the central police station. They booked me and then sat me in a room with a table and chairs. There was a phone on the table. <laughs> I picked it up and called Loring, not to ask for help, but to share my experience. I made a couple of other calls, too. It seemed funny to me that I, who didn't need a phone call could accidentally have the opportunity to make unlimited calls while I imagined others behind bars desperate to contact relative friends, lawyers. I wondered if there really was a one-call rule like in the movies. Next, they took me to an office with a social worker who asked me questions and said that my case would come up the next morning and that if I didn't have an attorney, one would represent me and since I had no record, I'd get a fine and be able to walk out 
and it would disappear from the records in a year. Then to a cell with four other men, older than me, and blacker. <laughs> None of them there for anything serious. We compared backgrounds, jail experiences. They'd each been in jail before. All their male friends had been busted for pot or loitering or drunkenness or petty theft. Almost none of mine had. But I'd been in jails a few times. They were surprised at that. I'd used jails to sleep in in Latin America and small towns in the U.S. when hitchhiking. Doesn't count. Okay, I was thrown in jail when I was 16 after being chased down by a bunch of cops that I didn't even know were chasing me. They found an almost empty fifth of scotch under Carol's skirt. Cop told me he'd never seen anyone drive so recklessly and not get into an accident, weaving in and out of cars on a freeway and exiting like a rocket, sliding sideways around corners on a country road. When I finally noticed a light behind me and pulled over, a half, a half dozen police vehicles followed. Mother was not pleased mailing me out. Got a ticket for going 70 in a 60. No other charge. <laughs> a cellmate said that if it had been him, they'd have locked him up for a good while. Told them about getting thrown in jail in Jackson, Mississippi on bogus charges during Freedom Summer. That definitely earned me points. One more arrest. I was a prisoner of war. No! Yes. They assumed it was in Vietnam, but I said I'd never been and would never become a soldier by mutual agreement with the Selective Service. <laughs> But selective service of the Army, I don't know who made that final decision. But I'd been a POW. How the hell? Well, I first came to California to stay with fellow potheads whom I'd lived with in Mexico City. We would get high and go tripping around the Bay Area. One late afternoon, we went to the Marin Headlands overlooking the Golden Gate Bridge and walked around in the dusk. We got so close to a Nike missile site that we triggered floodlights and caused German Shepherd guard dogs to bark menacingly. Notice that they were in cages with openings facing out toward us and tiptoed away, not wishing to see those gates open. <laughs> Checked out a couple of concrete artillery batteries that had been built to defend San Francisco from Japanese invasion. Smoked more pot and went running around in the grassy, sandy terrain. Slid down into a sandy pit like a golf course sand trap and there I was indeed trapped by two soldiers in uniform with helmets and rifles. They said they were taking me prisoner. <laughs> really? Uh, let's see, what country are we in? <laughs> Turned out they were from the Presidio Army base in a war game and took me for a spy from the other side in disguise. They dismissed my assurances that I was an innocent civilian caught in crossfire. Finally convinced them by asking if any soldiers were allowed to grow hair that long. They told me to find my buddies and go back the way we came from, unless we want more trouble. I sang some civil rights songs to my cellmates. Oh, freedom, oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me. And before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Moved on to gospels and folk songs and 50s, rhythm and blues. They'd join in and guys in nearby cells were adding voice and rhythm. 
It was terrific. Then a terrible thing happened. Chadwick, a policeman called out, interrupting. Yes, I said, startled. You've been bailed out. What? Someone paid your bail. Time to go. And he opened the cell. I refuse. I want to stay. You can't. Come on. After he threatened to come in and forcibly eject me, I said goodbye to my new friends and called out farewells as I walked off to freedom. Tammy was there to pick me up, Tamara Robertson. She'd become concerned and borrowed 25 bucks from Silas for my bail. I knew her from Austin College in Texas, where I'd gone briefly three years earlier. She was married to a band leader there, but now was single and among the young in San Francisco. Tammy became a well-known concert harpsichordist, at least in those parts. She helped me develop muscles as I helped her move her harpsichord when she'd moved from one third floor apartment to another, <laughs> and she moved a lot. She had met Silas when she was visiting me in a basement apartment I rented before moving to Loring's. Silas was so friendly and nice to visit like that. He was solid, wise, a most respected older student, and he was a businessman, an importer. He went to Asia to set up deals. He'd been in Taiwan earlier that year. He was about 30 and had an air of wisdom and kindness. I remember him saying that evening that life after death would be made up of the same stuff and not stuff as our life now. I asked, how on earth did monks preserve all those Buddhist teachings before there was writing? And there wasn't any for the first few hundred years. He said that preliterate people had memories that would seem to us like a superpower, that reading and writing has shrunk our memories. I asked him what to do with wandering mind in Zazen. He said, when you're sitting Zazen and have some idea and wonder what to do with it, put it in a box marked ideas <laughs> and let it go. There was a knock on the door, me reaching into the fridge, selling a guy a few tabs of acid for a dollar each. It wasn't illegal yet, but that made Silas's eyebrows rise. He didn't say anything, but I got the message that it's best if we leave that business behind. I did before long. The story of our lives can be seen as the story of our habits, the changes, and the tenacity. Silas told me I didn't have to sell LSD or steal thumbtacks to help buy Tassahara. <laughs> he said, if Dick can't come up with it, I'll buy it. I had my last acid trip with Tammy at Mere Woods a month before going to Tassahara. It was my eighth and her first. I turned lots of people on to psychedelics before coming to Zen Center and a few shortly after, but that petered out. Never had any problems. Had rules. I'd only do it if the person agreed to take it in a natural, non-social setting when they were feeling fairly good. No talking. That's where almost all the problems come from. And an empty stomach except for water and meditate beforehand. Tamara and I climbed up to the top of a meadow above the redwoods, a view overlooking trees in the Pacific Ocean. Nobody else there. She took it first, and I sat with her. She had a stretch of discomfort and finally settled into it. Didn't have a lot to say later. Psychedelics open up mountains and rivers more in us than we can imagine or report. It was cold. Took mine at sunrise. Sat full lotus without moving for eight hours. I recall Tammy going down the meadow a ways to speak to a park ranger who then walked on. My trip continued. In a transition from comprehensible consciousness to indescribable 
The word angfanger, represented in sound and glorious color, repeated over and over. At some point, there was an opening in the sky and what looked like people from another realm in a semicircle rather close, looking down at me and treating me to come on and join them. Or maybe they were just observing or saying hello. Hmm. Had a vision of Suzuki and Katagiri standing in their brown robes waiting for me, bathed in halos. I wondered why I couldn't join them, then realized that it was because I saw that union of form and emptiness as an event happening in the future that I was headed toward step by step, whereas that union was complete already, and it could only be found in this immediate shining present. It wasn't something that actions and thoughts led up to. Suddenly, I wanted to tell Tammy that I realized I was living with an idea of enlightenment being something to move toward, but only got out the words I was living when in a powerful bright flash, I was blasted physically backwards into the grass. That night, back in the city at Loring's, we wondered about the word angfanger that had been so impressed on me. A woman staying in a room there had studied German in college. So had I for a few classes and remembered nothing. She said, Anfanger with an umlaut, or could be written A-N-F-A-E-N-G-E-R, and it means beginner. Appropriate. Suzuki had mentioned beginner's mind. In lectures is something not to lose. I marveled at the insight that had come to me on the trip, but could see that, like other psychedelic experiences, even though it opened me up to possibilities of mind greater and clearly more real than normal waking consciousness, it wasn't sustainable. That's it, decided. No more tripping. I'll forsake seeking mind-blowing epiphanies. A curious understanding nestled in my mind. I'd sit sazen and study with Suzuki and Katagiri and keep it up, and also will not try to aim my practice at the future. Suzuki said that Buddhism was about uniting opposites, a teaching of contradiction. I also vowed to follow the Buddhist precepts as in not to take what is not given. This has been another Tassara story. and a Cuke audio podcast. I'm D.C. Puva of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, coming to you from Sleepy Sanur with Dog and Bandita, Feline Cuchita, and dear lovely Katrinka. And we're wishing you, and yours, and all of us, a grand awakening. Mm -hmm.